Listen to the Vibes, hosted by Coyote Night. Listen in for some positivity and good times. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. So anyway, that would be my advice to any aspiring screenwriters that might be listening in. Remember, Atlanta burns. You know, <laughs> keep it brief. You don't have to describe every last anything or you're going to run out of script pages in a hurry. Mm. You need to put just enough in there. So I, I said about that in 2010. I've written probably 20 or 30 scripts for people. Um, and we're finally on the cusp of getting some of them funded and produced. Um, that's not an easy task. Technology has made it affordable for the average person to make a good movie, mm -hmm. make it sound good. Because I mean, you know, think about all the recording studios and the camera equipment you had to have 10 or 15 years ago. And now, you know, there's parts of television shows being shot on Canon cameras, you know, photo cameras or even iPhones. And, you know, the editing software is accessible. So it's possible to create an industry acceptable film, but the two biggest cards, the distribution and the financing are still being elusive. Oh yeah. There's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. I mean, Netflix and all those guys have created a place and YouTube has created a place where people can create things and get them noticed that did not exist before, but still getting financing for motion picture. It's a risky enterprise. Everybody thinks, well, my story's going to sell. Uh, that wasn't true when you had to go for the box office because you're competing against Hollywood for the 3,500 movie screens in America mm -hmm. and you're not going to win. But then here comes, you know, blockbuster video and we've got a chance. You can get your video in the store and you don't have to be a big guy and you can make money from people renting your video. And then it went to, you know, Netflix and here we are Well, you can order millions of films. They, they, can't buy enough content now. So there is a place for anyone's movie and anyone's script um, and a way to get it marketed. But still, you know, when you put together a major movie to do it right, it still takes quite a bit of money. Oh, yeah. Well, um, you can, like you said, you could film something on an iPhone, go home, put the footage on a computer, and the stuff they can do nowadays is just mind-blowing yeah the effects alone that you can do inside of your phone you know substitute your face over elvis's or something like that and it looks <laughs> right. it looks fairly convincing i mean it's not going to look great 35 feet tall in a movie theater but it's sure going to look fine on somebody's phone or television set you know it's a whole different ball game and a whole different chance for people to be found and discovered and it's taken me 10 years of what I thought would be a quicker way to be discovered as a writer. Uh, but now, heck, you know, I just kept writing the scripts, all different subjects, all different genres. Now I've got this Chinese menu and I've been discovered by somebody and they're like, where did all this stuff come from? I'm like, well, you know, I just steady writing for 10 years. So persevere, keep at it. Don't be turned yeah. down. If you've got a legitimate story, get it out there. That's what I did. And even my Hayride book, it filled a niche, but it gave me something like an incredible calling card. If somebody wanted to say, you know, what do you do? What are your skills? I could just hand them that book and say, well, I wrote every word in this. I cleaned up every photograph. I laid it all out. You know, this will give you a good idea of my communication skills. And so every little bit of my past has now come forward to help me. Now that the Hayride book is done, I give myself permission to go back and write popular fiction. And so I'm working on a project in that regard uh, that I hope to finish up over the winter time. So we'll see. That's it, man. I've, I've been working on the movies and, and writing scripts. Last year, about the time that Ken Burns people uh, contacted me for his project, 
uh, a guy who owns the Rockabilly Hall of Fame reached out to me and said uh, that he was going to be putting in a museum in Horn Lake, Mississippi, which I thought, okay, I don't know where that is. I don't know what that is. He says, well, it's six miles south of Graceland and it was Elvis's horse ranch. Wow. I said, well, I didn't, know, I didn't know Elvis had a horse ranch. He said, oh yeah, 1967, he buys this 150 acre horse ranch and it was his hideaway where he and the band could go, he and Priscilla, have family, normal times. Press didn't know about it or bother him. Fans didn't know about it or bother him. So this guy is, is going to be building a brick and mortar museum. Contacted me because his father had been on the Louisiana Hayride. We hit it off. Uh, he invites me to become the curator for the museum. And uh, we start working on projects to promote the, uh, the museum in advance of, of groundbreaking. We'll, we'll break ground in the next couple of years, but we're going to have a series of concerts uh, this next year on the ranch and uh, big name rockabilly acts and things like that. And just showing the genesis of how the music evolved from hillbilly into rockabilly into mm -hmm. rock and roll. And of course, Elvis and the Hayride were a key part of that. So um, that's going on. And that is really what, uh, got the attention of this investor group that I'm now involved in was the interest in that. And then when they found out about the work that I've done on the Louisiana Hayride and the movie scripts, we're putting together all kinds of things. Um, I, I went to, go ahead. If you have Brian Setzer show up, you've got to call yeah. me. <laughs> He's on it. And, and oh. He will, he will be part of it. And, uh, one of the things that we were planning is the first, induction ceremony. There have been uh, several online Rockabilly Hall of Fames that issued certificates or just put somebody's name into an online Hall of Fame. But those efforts, uh, the, the owners of those two efforts have passed on and they didn't, they didn't establish anything to leave behind. So we're doing the brick and mortar museum and absorbing those inductees. And we want to do an induction ceremony in May it was scheduled to be done on the ranch. But uh, just this last month, we went out to Los Angeles and met with the investment group and then went to meet with some of our partners in the, uh, the shows themselves who live in Las Vegas. And while they're, we're there in Las Vegas, we're staying at the hotel where Elvis held court for 800 and something consecutive shows. And the uh, vice president of the hotel gives us a tour of the penthouse and of the, the green room and the dressing room and the stage. And, you know, we tell him what we're doing. He gets excited and says, well, let me ask you something. Would you consider having your award show at our hotel here in Vegas, your induction ceremony? And we thought about it because the whole point is to create interest in the ranch and get people aware of it because even a lot of hardcore Elvis fans don't know about it. But we thought, you know, it makes sense. Elvis fled Las Vegas to the ranch. So why don't we use Las Vegas as the point to announce the ranch as a destination and then go to the ranch over the summer and do all of these high profile shows. Oh, that's a pretty smart idea. You know, and so the hotel offers all their backing. We go back to our investors and they said, oh, well, we didn't even know you were considering that. We're tied in to Vegas in a bunch of ways. So let's do a mega show. Let's not do some little, you know, some kind of low level show. Let's blow this thing out. Let's get Netflix involved. Let's dream big. And that's where we're at now. I mean, you talk about Brian Setzer and they said, put together your wish list. And I said, um, Paul McCartney? And I'm like, sure, why not? So, I mean, you know, it's getting out of hand very quickly. And we'll <laughs> see We'll see what develops. A lot of planning has to be done in the next couple of weeks. But it looks like at this point, we're going to be doing a kickoff show at the end of May, or COVID delays it a little bit, maybe June or early July. And then a whole series of events at the ranch, which is where Elvis spent the last couple of weeks of his uh, honeymoon. And there's a honeymoon cottage there that we're restoring. Um, 
and all kinds of other things on the ranch. So great things to come in the rockabilly world for me. And hopefully we're going to throw a few movie projects in the bundle and, you know, you just keep shoving those irons in the fire and all of a sudden fire's catching on and now the woods is about to catch on fire, I think, but you know, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling when things start to actually churn, you know? Well, it is and that they overlap because I had a bunch of disjointed projects that now all make sense under that umbrella. 10, 15, 20, 30 years worth of stuff. You know, all these different experiences finally make sense in some grand scheme. So I'm excited about the future. I mean, we'll see what happens. It's been a heck of a ride up to this point. And uh, I'm just excited to see where it goes. I, I may be building exhibits at a Rockabilly Hall of Fame somewhere we were out in Vegas. Wayne Newton heard about the Hall of Fame. He says, well, you're the guy I need to talk to. He said, did you know there's not a Las Vegas Entertainers Museum and Hall of Fame? And I said, no, I wasn't aware of that. He goes, well, we got to talk. You need to make one and I'm going to help you. I'm like, yeah, even just getting to meet Wayne Newton. Blew my mind. Right. <laughs> you know, we had dinner with the Righteous Brothers. They're like, hey, we'll help you with your show. Yeah, it's just it's oh, just man. getting it's just getting silly i can't even talk about it because it's just so far beyond any world that i've inhabited up to this point you know? <laughs> that's incredible i mean you know i say the history the the music those are all the things that i love so you've made the perfect guest for me <laughs> man oh man and if i get to do the henderson story i wrote a louisiana hayride script but it's such an overview that it reads to me like some kind of a Hallmark movie. I mean, usually like with I Walk the Line, they focused in on Johnny Cash's addiction to pain pills mm -hmm. and how June and Mother Maybell helped him with that. And they focused on a certain period of his life. But the Hayride story, you know, I use Webb Pierce as kind of my model person, but I tell Hank's story. I tell a lot of things because when I wrote it, I was very enthusiastic about it. So. I may do a different story there that, that focuses a little more closely, or, you know, we may do that script and put it out like a Hallmark project. Why not? Well, you know, this show has been basically dedicated to help people to, you know, number one, get a dream. Number yes. two, you know, seek it out and, you know, being uncomfortable, you need to get comfortable with that. You know what I mean? You go out on, and into the unknown, you take a chance. Things can get scary, but you don't want to be on your deathbed and say, I wished I had, I wished I had. Yes, that's it. I mean, I pressed forward for years. I just kept writing new projects while I waited. I tried to make connections on the movie sets and in other places you find a whole lot of people that offer to help you. They'll say, well, yeah, I know so-and-so because they're bragging about their association and you come to find out they really don't know so-and-so. One guy was like, yeah, you want to get that guy in your movie? I went, you know, he and I are old friends. You know, I can get him for you. And I go to the fellow and I said, all right, here's the budget for the movie. You know, when can you reach out to him? And he's like, well, you know, we went to high school together and he was a couple of grades ahead of me. And I hadn't seen him, you know, in 30 years. And I don't know if he'd know me if I did. And it's like, what <laughs> happened to, you know, your best bud? And so there's a lot of pitfalls out there. There's a lot of folks that will promise to help you. And when it comes down to put up or shut up, you just don't hear from them anymore. And so mm -hmm. don't get discouraged when that happens. There are ways, and I think it's getting easier now because of you know, the ability to sit on your bed cross-legged with a microphone in front of you and sing some cover Fleetwood Mac cover song and, you know, get discovered on TikTok. That's a different world. That's yeah. you being discovered for your own merits, not having to give an interview with the one person that's going to decide if your movie gets to be one of the, you know, a couple hundred that are put into the movie theaters each year. Entirely different landscape. So absolutely. Yeah stick with it, stay the course, keep creating. Because even if it doesn't make sense to you in the moment, it keeps your juices going and you're gonna end up with a whole pile of stuff that at some point becomes overwhelming 
and an archive of its own. You know, well, you know when I used to take creative writing, one of the the things you always start off with is just brainstorming. You write down everything that you can think of that you want to talk about. You want to be in your story. Some of it you use, and some of it just you know it's junk. You don't you don't need it, but it has to start somewhere. And then once you start, you know, putting that together, and it's all the pieces fit it's it's just yep. becomes a beautiful thing it is you know i wish i could have gotten this done 20 years ago i, I kind of wandered my 20s and 30s doing a little here and a little there not really sure what i wanted to do started a few clubs and restaurants and once i got those up and running i realized i was in love with the creative process you know i didn't want to sit there and listen to drunk people's stories every night or you know, uh, be back in the kitchen slopping food. And it was like, okay, next. And so if mm. you're a creative soul, keep creating, write, whether you think anybody's going to see it or not, because someday they might. And, uh, you know, it's a process yeah. that, that we have to do just to feel alive. Yeah. And, you, you never know, you know, um, and, and maybe the first few times you do it, it doesn't work out, but something is going to click. If yeah. Just, my father, give when up. he was, my father, when he was a young man, um, listened to the new medium of radio. I mean, he was born in 1923. Radios were just stations just started coming out in 22. So as a young boy, he's listening to radio and he gets, he becomes enamored of it. When he's 15, one summer, uh, he finds out he's got a cousin that lives in New York City and the cousin's dad works at Radio City Music Hall where all these famous soap operas and, you know, Cecil B. DeMille's there and all these uh, different theatrical productions are. So he goes to see the cousin over the summer and the dad says, well, why don't you come down, you know, to the hall and, you know, you can sit in and watch some of these radio dramas being made. And so they do that. My father's just in hog heaven. And then the dad was a pretty cool dad. And he's like, well, hey, you know, down the hallway, they are doing a police drama and they need somebody to clop the shoes. You know, somebody walking. Do you want to go be the shoe clopper? My father's like, oh, heck yeah. He runs down the hallway. He starts clopping the shoes. And then the guy goes, well, you know, you got a kind of a mature sounding voice. So they need somebody to play the bellboy over on this radio drama and you say floor 21 or something like that. Oh yeah, I'm all about that. And he goes and does that, flits back and forth that day and just has a blast and begs the man to let him come down the next day. And he just takes off. He's doing these little radio dramas and there's a, he's 15 years old. He looks older, but he's 15. Meets this guy 23 years old in doing some drama for him. And the guy says, man, you know, you're spunky. I like you. I'm starting a new theatrical company. Do you want to come be a part of it? And he's like, well, I'm 15. You know, my mom's a one room school teacher back in Virginia. I, I can stay for the summer, I guess, if I get permission. So mama says, heck yeah, you know, have the experience. Go ahead, do it. So he joins up with this guy. Guy says, you know, you can crash on my couch, me and my roommate. You know, just until you get off your feet. I mean, you'll start making some decent money here pretty quick. You can get your own place. So my father says yes. And, you know, the next thing you know, this guy forms his theatrical company with his roommate, John Hausman. And the guy in question is Orson Welles. And my father is brought in as, as an original member of the Mercury Theater on the air. And at age 15, plays three different roles in the War of the Worlds broadcast. Wow, that is freaking amazing. It's insane. He's living there. He calls his mama at the end of the summer and she's like, you ready to come home? He goes, mama, mama, you're making $500 a year as a one room school teacher. I made that this month and I'm 15. And so, you know, he went back and forth. He did some school. He would come home for school for a little while, but because his mother was a one room school teacher, he was several grades ahead and could do his homework easy enough, though he's back to New York every chance he gets. And uh, he does this back and forth, but it becomes kind of a lonely life because all of the, his peers are back in school. Mm -hmm. And there's one day 
that uh, it's time for rehearsal. It's a big radio drama. And they're having their one rehearsal before they go live that night. Where's Dave? Where's he at? They can't find him. Finally, somebody tracks him down. He's behind the building in the alley playing stickball with a bunch of kids. So they round him up and bring him back in there and the director lights into him. What the hell do you think you're doing? You know, you got 40 people depending on you to be here. You're one of the primary roles and you're off acting like a kid. And the guy used some off color adjectives while he was yelling at my father. And my father said he realized in that moment that the guy was right, that, you know, his heart wasn't in it. There was something wrong. And uh, my father just looked at him and said, yeah, that's because I am a blah, blah, blah kid. And uh, he quit right then. And the man he just told that to was Cecil B. DeMille. And no the Lux Theater, he did the show that night and then he packed up and he went back home. And he, he finished out school and he worked as a radio DJ at the local radio station and you know, played bluegrass with some of Bill Monroe's boys and just never looked back. But uh, you know, for two or three years, just because it was his obsession, you put yourself in the right place at the right time and sometimes you can get noticed. I tried that in the movies, got noticed by a few people, but they were just too busy to help. You know, Denzel Washington, sweet guy, very helpful, let me do my own thing as a set dresser, said, told me one day, he said, you know, we do what we have to do so that we can do what we want to do. Yeah. That was kind of the mantra that he shared with his family and it made a lot of sense to me. But I mean, that guy just went on to another universe and, and wasn't around to help and, and I, I wasn't gonna impose on him. You're, that's your job and it, it, you don't approach the stars. You have to act like they're normal people and leave them alone. Every once in a while, you know, you share a donut with Ethan Hawke in the tent and talk about being on diets or, you know, tell Gerard Butler the wonders of double matcha green tea. But uh, the rest of the time, you're just a worker in the background, you know, so. Uh, it's funny you say that. Uh, I met Adrian Paul a couple of years ago and we had about a 20, 30 minute conversation on how to handle our arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. I mean, uh, uh, somebody had mentioned to Gerard that he needed to be drinking this double matcha green tea. Mm -hmm. And I walk up to the craft service area and he's in a conversation with this Chinese woman who's an extra. And she doesn't, I mean, she's telling him, oh yeah, that's what you need for what you're trying to, whatever ailment he was trying to cure himself of. And I walked in on the conversation and I wasn't any authority on it, but he just looked from her to me and said, you know anything about double matcha green tea? And I'm like, no, but I can go get you a bunch from Crafty and put it in your tent. And he said, would you do that? I said, yeah, sure. So, you know, and after that, every time we met in the craft service area, you know, he would talk to me and we would just talk about life. Same way with Chris Pratt when I was working on uh, Jurassic World. He was wearing a brown vest and this, this, this certain outfit that he, that he wears in the movie. And a friend of mine does stunts. And he told me, man, you're on Jurassic World. You need to get me on with the stunt department. So go find out who's the stunt coordinator and find out who I need to call. Because if I call the office, they'll never give me anyone's contact information. So I go up to uh, the assistant director and I'm like, okay, where, where's the stunt director guy? And he says, that's him over there. And he points to a fella and I go over there and start chatting him up. And I'm like, hey man, you know, my buddy's a great stunt man. He was in Great Debaters. He was Denzel Washington's stunt double. You know, how does he get on the team? Is there a possibility? Can I get your contact information? He's like, well, you know, I'll tell you what. You pretty much just need to call the front office and they'll put you in touch with the right people. And I said, well, wouldn't that decision be yours? And right then time is called for set. And he's like, man, I gotta go. I'm sorry, I wish you luck, buddy. And he takes off and I think, man, what a jerk, you know? And I go back to my friend and I said, you know, I thought you said this guy was gonna help me out. And, you know, 
he said, well, who did you go see? And I said, you told me to go see that dude over there in the brown vest. He goes, dude, that's Chris Pratt. <laughs> he said, the stunt coordinator is stunting for him right now. So he's in the identical outfit. Well, I didn't see that guy. He was off somewhere else. And he comes walking up and I'm like, oh boy. So, you know. The next year I'm on Magnificent Seven and I meet Chris Pratt in the tent. And I said, do you remember me? You know, I'm the guy that was bugging you about the stunts. He goes, that's who you are. You know, so we hit it off and he's telling me all these wild stories from, uh, you know, some of the movies he's done. So you just, you just never know man, what's going to happen. Man, I love Chris Pratt. He's awesome. That's he was down to earth, man. They had just finished filming. What was the, uh, the, the, comic book movie that he did with the little uh, raccoon guardians of the galaxy guardians of the galaxy he was telling me his idea for a sequel and it was crazy then going down to south america and you know doing all kinds of crazy stuff i don't even remember we we were both laughing and i thought here's chris pratt you know sharing some idea that the studio system rejected as outlandish but that he thinks is funny and it was funny and we were just you know having these little moments on set. And then Denzel was in that movie too. And I thanked him for allowing me the latitude he gave me as a set dresser on uh, The Great Debaters. So, man, you know, when you treat people, you know, just as if they were your friend or, you know, whatever, yeah. without being all googly eyed and everything else, treat them like, you know, they, they should be treated. They're, they're a human being. They have, you know, different likes and stuff than just being in movies or television. And, you know, you start doing that, you can make some great friends. Well, yeah. I mean, on the, on the, the uh, Magnificent Seven, Ethan Hawke came up to me at one point. Well, because we had met in the craft service tent and nobody else was in there. And he was biting into a Krispy Kreme donut. And I walked in and just for fun said, aha. And he turned around, little did I know that, I think he was married to Uma Thurman at the time. And he's like, dude, I'm supposed to be on a diet. And you know, you gotta swear yourself to secrecy. And I'm like, who am I gonna tell? But he's just joking with me. He hands me a donut and he goes, you gotta eat one too. And we're, <laughs> we're blood brothers now. So I did that. And then a couple of days later, I'm an onset dresser. And part of my deal in the movies is continuity. If you pick up a glass in a scene and put it back on the table, and they do another take, I got to put that glass back where it was, make sure it's filled to the right level, you know, because when you cut back and forth with the cameras, if things jump around, or, you know, if you're Game of Thrones and somebody's left the Starbucks cup in the shot, then <laughs> that's my fault. And so I'm allowed to have a camera. Other than the camera operators, I'm one of the few people that actually can use his phone and take pictures in order to reset the set. Mm -hmm. Well, Ethan notices that and he goes, dude, would you mind taking some pictures, you know, when I fall off the roof and I do this because, you know, if I try to get them out of production, they're, they're not going to give it to me until after the movie's edited. And I like, you know, to have some stuff for my IMDb page. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. So I'm taking pictures of him. And I said, well, how do you want me to, to get those to you? And he goes, well, dude, just take my number down or here, I'll give you my email. And I'm thinking, you know, and then Vincent D'Onofrio comes over and says, let me give you my email. Because I told him, I asked him, I said, well, I've got a script I'd like you to be in. I wrote it with you in mind. You know, I'd like to get this thing to you. How do I do that? What's your agent's contact information? He goes, well, just send it to my email. Here it is, blah, blah, blah. I'm going, this is, this is crazy. You know, and then other people are coming up to me asking me to take pictures of them. And I did make some friends with uh, some of those kind of guys. And, you know, it was very real. But on one of my very first movies that I worked on, uh, right after The Mist, I went to work on Welcome Home, Roscoe Jenkins, and uh, was doing something on that. And there were two movies being made at the same time in that giant AT&T warehouse in Shreveport. And so I come up to a craft service table, and there's some of the guys from the other movie, and they're complaining about how they need a driver for one of their trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, our driver had just finished working, and so I jump into the conversation said, hey guys, you know, I, uh, my friend Johnny is the set deck driver and, uh, you know, I can put you in touch if, if you need that. And the man who was complaining about not having a driver looked at the person that he was still talking to and said, is someone talking to me? 
why is someone talking to me? And I just shook my head and I said, no, dude, nobody's talking to you. And I walked off and I thought, who are you? You know, you're like one pay grade above me. You're a worker bee like I am. And what's, what's with that? But you get, you get quite a, a lot of the, the, Frozen. The double latte crowd that doesn't, you know, you don't remember them fondly. And, uh, you know, I much prefer the stories of, of where these people were approachable because they are regular people. Yeah. yeah. But I, I've, I was surprised how many people that I've met doing the show that, um, you know, one, you show them respect. Number two, you treat them like a human being. And before you know it, you have made a friend. You know, I've got numbers to people and I'm not going to mention any names, but you know, there's people out there I never thought I'd ever be friends with and I can text them or call them anytime and, Oh, Hey man, you know, they're not busy. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, when I wrote my book and I hooked up with this guy with the rockabilly hall of fame, one of his board members is Wink Martindale. The, oh, you wow. know, the, the game show host from the seventies yeah. and eighties is how I knew him. But Wink was a disc jockey in Memphis at the radio station when Sam Phillips brought the record to Dewey Phillips, who I thought was his brother, but there's no relation. He brought the record to Dewey Phillips and Wink Martindale. Wink was the one that had to run down the street and find Elvis and drag him out of a movie theater and try to get an interview on the radio. So this is a guy who goes way back. And Wink had a radio dance show, uh, a television dance show a year before Dick Clark had American Bandstand. So this guy has some teeth in the game and Wink wants a copy of my book. So I send it to him and he says, well, as long as you're mailing some out, you know, uh, can I get an extra copy? And I said, well, yeah, sure. And he goes, yeah, my wife is business partners with Priscilla Presley. And, you know, we'd like to get her a copy too. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I mentioned Johnny Horton and his, widow Billie Jean. I talked with her daughter, bought my book, and she said, can I get a copy for Mama? And I sent one to Billie Jean, and she, it was the greatest trip down memory lane for her, two of her former husbands in there. And so I get a review from her. I, I get it to her, and I get it to Priscilla. That's Elvis, Hank Williams, Johnny Horton. That's, those are the people, the survivors, and that's like, the best I could hope for that they liked my book because yeah. it's their dang story. you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, you've, you've given them memories back, you know? Yeah. And that's oh. it. I was just glad to see that the Chronicle was even handed enough because I didn't want to take sides and I didn't want to, you know, make anybody mad. There's plenty of stories just to tell that these people were there. You don't have to tell, who made a fool of themselves or who did this or who did that. You know, that's, that's not my job with that book. Right. Father wrote dime novels back in the day after he got through with Orson Welles and that whole thing, he came back home and, and formed a little neighborhood writing club. And there was a guy named Nelson Bond who wrote a bunch of popular sci-fi books and dime novels. And there was, you know, they're sitting trying to crank out these, these stories, these detective stories and things like that for those true crime detective magazines. And their neighbor down the street is just this annoying guy writing, writing sci-fi stuff. And I mean, they're, they're, they're taking this as a craft and they're taking a month to create this beautiful detective story. And this guy's just cranking out the sci-fi. What do you think about this? I wrote this today and I wrote this tonight. And I'm, uh, you know, I wrote these three yesterday, just crank it out high volume. And they're like, Ray, man, come on, dude, you know, put some quality into some of this. So Nelson Bond ended up making somewhat of a name for himself. He and my father wrote a play together that became the first play ever done on television. And it was the first thing that Hollywood ever bought from television. Um, and it was also the first rerun on television. But other than that, my father and uh, Nelson passed into obscurity, but uh, Ray Bradbury made quite the name for himself. 
So, <laughs> you know, you just never know. You just you never, never know. You never know. Stick with it. You know. Exactly. That's the message to anyone creative. Stick with it. And, yes. you know, always make it at least for you because it may matter to somebody else when you least expect it. That's right. Well, you know, it, I'm 50 years old and I'm just getting into stuff that I really enjoy doing. I did public works for 20 some odd years and, you know, you, you get comfortable when, you, you know, like the job I had, very comfortable doing what I was doing and, but I wasn't happy. And yeah. I encourage people, you know, if you have a dream, pursue it, you know, you have to get out of that comfort zone. It, just like when you work out, you know, you put your body through stress and you tear up those muscles and they build on top of each other, you know, to get that result. You have to kind of do that with your life. You know, you go out there and take your lumps and it makes you grow. That's it. I mean, we reached a point a couple of years ago where the wife said, look, you got to, you can't keep taking on these spec projects because you know you need to do the paid projects and i was fortunate enough to get enough paid writing gigs but there were still a few projects that i was approached with that i believed in and wanted to do them on the side and there was one that you know came in after the moratorium had been established and so at three o'clock in the morning or odd moments of the day when i had a few spare moments I put together this script and it ended up being a major Hurricane Katrina story. That's why I decided to take it on because it was the banner national story of a nursing home tragedy that happened after Katrina. And uh, I believed in the author and the author seemed well connected. Um, this was a year and a half ago, just about three weeks ago, I was approached by a producer who heard that there was a finally a script based on this book and would I share it with him? And I did. And he came back and he said, I loved it. With your permission, I'd like to take it to the folks at the A&E Network. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> he said, well, yeah, I'm just taking it there first because I've produced over 300 episodes of biography for them. So they'll listen to me. And I was like, oh my God, okay, dude. You know, uh, he said, well, I envision a four part like Netflix type series. What, what do you, did you envision? And I said, well, a four part Netflix series. That's why it's, you know, 205 pages long. <laughs> so it better be. And he said, yeah, good. That's what I thought. So that's out there floating in the universe and we'll see if anything comes of that. He just, and that was something I literally wrote over a year and a half you know, a few moments here and a few moments there. So, and never give up. That's the thing. Never give up. I, you know, I did, I did a pilot for a show for A and E it never made it. And we waited almost two years before we even got to start filming and then had to wait months and months and months for him to finish editing just for him to tell us no. That's it. And there'll be plenty of those moments too. And just yeah. never give up. Never never give up just keep doing it for doing it and it's going to add up to something i started entering festivals with my scripts because it made sense to me that if i'm over here shouting and waving a script going hey i got this great story well how many people have i encountered everybody thinks their story's great how do i get around that well let me go enter it in these festivals where they have seven judges and if i can win an award any kind of an award that's seven opinions that don't have any vested interest in my future. So that's got to mean something. Well, I kept entering festivals over the last 10 years. I got 150 film festival awards now. And, you know, my wife's like, what are you, some pageant girl? And I said, no, I, you know, I don't accept the trophies. I don't want them. I just want the awards to represent. That's over a thousand people's opinions other than mine that just says, please, take a few moments and read this thing, make up your own mind. I'm not asking you to accept it because it won the awards. I just want you to turn page one because it, it won those awards. And so do things like that that are within your control, anything to raise your profile above the normal. And I mean, there's plenty of festivals out there that are 10 bucks, you know, and it's just like buying a lottery ticket. 
because it takes six months before you find out anyway. So go buy your lottery ticket and sit back. And then one day your email goes off and hey, you're an official selection. That's an award. And then you go to official finalist. Then you maybe you get first, second, or third, or or this, that, or the other. And you know, each one's an award. So uh, it ends up adding up to something. The more time you put in, the more other people validate what you've got going on. Then sooner or later, somebody's got to pay attention to you and keep trying to get yourself in front of the right people. It's not the way you think. Don't. It's not getting an agent and becoming script number 200 on their pile this week, because that, that won't work. It's who you know, it's, it's finding more direct connection. But ask your friends, because you never know who knows somebody who went to school with so-and-so and their fishing buddies. And maybe you can pry that into something, maybe not. Worth a shot. At least try. If you can at least say that you tried that that's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I've got the Hayride book. If I get nothing further on this planet, there's some evidence that I was here and made some kind of a meaningful contribution to the recording of an element of history. You know, exactly. so I'll sit on that. If anything else comes, great. Let's do it. I heard that. So there you go, bud. I appreciate your time. And uh, man, we've been at this for two hours now. <laughs> yeah. You get me going, man. I I give talks on the A rod and I just rattle on, man. You know, hey, that anytime you want to talk about that or anything else, um, my platform is open to you. Beautiful. And well, thank you for having me on and for the chance to share and maybe, you know, reach a few folks and, and encourage them and, and keep at it. You know, if I get to give any big acceptance speech in my future, that's what it's going to be about is, you know, helping other folks. If you announce that you can help people, then follow through on it. Because, you know, if you don't, it takes these people longer. And who knows, for every script that makes it, there's a hundred that are amazing. You know, there's so many stories out there. And I'm, I'm thankful now that the content providers have this great hunger for documentary projects, for history, for television, for anything. So thank you kindly. I appreciate you. I appreciate you and your time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network and on Instagram at The Vibes Broadcast.